in just a moment, we're going to baptize several of our people. Before we do, I want us to look very briefly at Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, it describes for us this day that we celebrate. You know, as I think about Easter, I think about not only certainly the Lord dying for our sins, rising again the third day, but I am quickly reminded that all of life, all of life and all of eternity hinges upon what Jesus did there at Calvary and rose again the third day. For if he had not risen again the third day as he said he would, then we might as well go home because there's nothing worth living for. But if he did die and rise again just as he said, and he did, then life is worth living because he lives because all of heaven awaits us. It is our lot, all of us, here and there, to have to attend funerals. Do you know that when one of our loved ones dies in the Lord, that we can come to a funeral time? We can even have the seats for us there here at the front. But we can come to a time like that because Jesus is alive and has conquered death, hell, and the grave. In fact, I was thinking about that this past week a lot. And I was thinking about the fact that you and I are brothers and sisters in Christ if you know the Lord Jesus. And you and I, if we know the Lord, are going to live forever in a place called heaven that he has prepared for us through his death, burial, and resurrection. So let's read about it and uh, then we'll baptize together. Now, you know, let me mention this to you. You know that I mentioned last week, I personally believe he was crucified on Thursday. There's a lot of reasons for that, uh, not the least of which he comes into Jerusalem on that Sunday, which would have been Nisan the 10th. Exodus chapter 12, verse 3 said that every Israelite was to take a lamb from their flock. They were to watch it until the 14th of Nisan. They were to watch that lamb to be sure that it was perfect and without blemish. Exodus chapter 12, verse 6 says, Then on the 14th day of the month, at twilight, you are to kill it. It's interesting that he's talking to Israel, but he uses a singular pronoun and says you are to kill it at twilight. As I was reading back through that this past week, I wondered, why doesn't he say, then you are to kill them at twilight? Because he was looking forward to the Lamb of God who would be slain for the foundation of of the world. But there's another reason that I think that, and that is simply Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, where Jesus said, as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And so you had to have three nights. That's another reason that I believe that it was, in fact, on a Thursday. Here's one more, chapter 28, verse 1 of Matthew. And I looked up this again because no translation save one translates it this way. And I'll just go ahead and tell you the word Sabbath in chapter 28, verse 1 of Matthew is plural. So if I were to read it as it is in the Greek, here's what I would read. Now, after the Sabbaths, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, of course, John in his gospel speaks in chapter 19, verse 31, that that Sabbath was a high day the next day. Friday was a high day Sabbath, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then the normal Sabbath on Saturday. But Matthew 28, 1, now after the Sabbaths, and it's plural, you can look it up if you'd like, the word is sabbaton, T-W-N is the ending word that makes it plural. After the Sabbaths, as it, and somebody says, well, does it really matter? You know, it really does matter when the Lord was crucified. It really does matter that he rose again the third day. Let's read this together. Now, after the Sabbaths, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. Now, think about that. Sat upon it. As I said a moment ago, defying heaven and earth, or hell and earth, we could say, to put that stone back in its place. So it wasn't just rolled out of the way. In fact, the Bible says the stone was taken out of its groove. Behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook. The word shook is the same word we get earthquake from. We could say the guards quaked. The guards quaked. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. Now, interestingly, he doesn't say that to the guard. He says it to the women, doesn't he? The guards had every reason to be afraid because they knew not Christ. The women were looking for Christ. They need not be afraid. 
Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. Think with me for just a moment on the subject, the glory of the resurrection. First of all, the Lord honors the day. It was on the first day of the week. You and I worship on the first day of the week because that is the day of resurrection. I think, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, Paul says, but on the first day of the week, let everyone lay aside as God has prospered. We worship on the first day of the week, Sunday, Sunday. We worship the Lord. And so the day is honored, the first day of the week. Secondly, notice with me, God has spoken. Verse 2 says, a severe earthquake had occurred. As I thought about that, I thought, why is it nobody seemed to realize something major is going on here? Now think with me about this. A severe earthquake occurs, you would think everybody around would be wondering what is going on, let's find out, but it doesn't happen that way. The ladies come to the tomb, and by the way, even they were not expecting a resurrection. It's kind of interesting in the whole Easter story, the only ones who really were expecting it were the religious leaders who went to Pilate and said, we remember that deceiver said he was going to rise again the third day. Go and make the, the sepulcher sure so that that will not happen. Otherwise, the first de delusion will be worse than the last. And so the only ones who really thought he was going to rise again were the ones who didn't believe in him, actually. These women come to the tomb that morning preparing uh, to anoint his body, not expecting that he would not be there. Power is displayed in verse 2, this severe earthquake. But why didn't anybody else care about that? Why, if there was a severe earthquake, why didn't anybody else seem to care about it? Can I tell you something about our day today? It's Easter Sunday. Why does the world, for the most part, not care about it? Why does the world, for the most part, go on about their business and they don't give two thoughts about it? Fourthly, death is defeated. Death is defeated. Verse 2. A severe earthquake occurred. An angel of the Lord came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. By the way, the, the, the angel didn't roll away the stone to let the Lord out, but to let us in. Amen? Amen. The Lord had already resurrected. The angel moved that stone so that the whole world could see that the tomb is empty. Okay? I called up some pictures. There's a picture on the front of your bulletin of Gordon's Calvary. I didn't get a recent picture because now it has gates and bars in front of it because everybody who toured Israel wanted to get a little piece out of it, and so they had to put bars and all that kind of thing up now to get there. But death has been defeated. By the way, I won't go into all the verses, but resurrection is not a New Testament-only kind of a thing, not a New, a New Testament-only kind of a thing. For example, in Job 19, well, let me look at one of them, uh, maybe two of them. And we'll bring this to Job, for example, chapter 19, verse 25. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth. Even, in, even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God. Let me mention another. How about Daniel, chapter 12? Daniel, chapter 12, verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Resurrection is a theme throughout the whole Bible, that man will live again either in heaven or in hell. And that is the truth. Every person will live forever. The difference is in heaven or in hell. Everybody that you would talk to wants to go to heaven. And if you were to talk to them, they would, they would talk as if they were going to heaven. It's good to be reminded that just what Easter really means, that Easter is the Lord Jesus preparing us to go to heaven and only those who trust in him have eternal life. And so death is defeated. Death is defeated. Back to Matthew chapter 28. Notice in verse 4, his enemies are defeated. His enemies are vanquished. Verse 4, the guards shook for fear of him, became like dead men. They needed to shake. 
They needed to shake. They needed to understand that something major is going on here. Our world today is, is, is two kinds of people, those who have been saved and those who have not been saved. And those who have not been saved need to worry. They need to worry. They need to worry what's going to happen when I take my last breath here. But then they need to worry themselves to a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, who is life eternal. But then notice that comfort is assured, verse 5. The angel says to the women, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Comfort is assured. Then the truth is declared, verse 6. He's not here. He's risen. Come see the place where he laid. They give that invitation Verse uh, 7, notice this, the assignment is given. Go quickly, tell his disciples. He's going ahead of you into Galilee, I've told you. In other words, you know what to do, do it. Verse 8, notice obedience is rendered. They left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy, ran and reported it to the disciples. Then notice that worship is accepted in, chapter, in verse 9. They grabbed hold of his feet and took hold of him and worshiped him. Isn't it interesting? Jesus doesn't say, don't worship me, worship only the Father. No, worship Jesus. You are worshiping the Father. You are worshiping God. And so they worship him. Then a repeated assurance in verse 10. Jesus says to them the same thing the angel said, do not be afraid, but go into Galilee and talk to my brethren. Now I want to close with this. He says, go to my brethren. Isn't that interesting? He says, go into Galilee to my brethren and tell them to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. He calls them my brethren. And why is that so interesting? In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 31, Jesus had said to his disciples, all of you are going to fall away. All of you are going to act like you don't even know me. Chapter 26, verse 31. A few verses later, chapter 26, verse 56, says this, and they all left him and fled. Why is that so important? Because the last thing that they had a relationship and a conversation with the Lord Jesus was there. And now notice what he says in verse 10, go and take word to my brethren, my brethren. You know what Jesus could have said? He could have said, I'll tell you what I want you to do. You go find those sorry disciples who said they would never leave me who said they would be with me to the very end. You go find them. They're hiding somewhere, and you go tell them, see what's happened now. None of that. He says, go and find my brethren and tell them what's happened here. It's a reminder to you and me that he is always willing to forgive us our sins, our trespasses, always willing to cleanse us, always, always. On this Easter Sunday, have you given your heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ? It would be horrible to go through an Easter Sunday and not know personally the one whose death and resurrection you celebrate. Do you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior today? I tried to talk to our baptismal candidates a moment ago that baptism is ultimately identification. We are identifying with Christ. You know that Jesus himself came to John the Baptist and was baptized. Why did, he didn't have any sin. Why was he baptized? He, what he was doing was identifying with John the Baptist's message. Jesus rendered himself to be baptized. When we come to the waters of baptism, we are identifying with Christ. And that's really what salvation is. It is to say, Lord, I don't want to live for me. I want you to give me the strength to live for you. I ask you to forgive my sins. Come into my heart, and I will serve you. I close with this. Charles Weigel was born on November the 20th, 1871. He was born in Lafayette, Indiana, to a German family. His father was a German baker. His mother, not surprisingly, kept the home because they had 12 children. <laughs> Charles Weigel uh, had four other brothers and seven sisters. Charles Weigel, as he writes about his life, says that every day following breakfast, his family would gather around and they would read the scriptures together. Charles Weigel himself was saved when he was 12 years old. In fact, he lived to be 95 years old. His last several years were at the great Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. When he was on up in years, he asked 
Lee Roberson, the pastor of Highland Park Church in Chattanooga, if he could somehow live on the campus and speak to the students and identify with the students. And so they made him a little apartment called the Weigel Apartment, and Charles Weigel lived there for the last 10 to 12 years of his life where he was impacting the students of the colleges there. In fact, Dr. Lee Roberson, when I did my dissertation, I used Dr. Lee Roberson uh, because he is probably the one who said everything rises or falls on leadership. It's attributed usually to John Maxwell, but Lee Roberson probably is really the one who said it. And so Charles Weigel lived on the campus and spoke to the students the last probably 10 to 12 years of his life, died at 95 years old. The reason that's important is because Lee Roberson, Dr. Lee Roberson of the Highland Park Church in Chattanooga said when Dr. Weigel was 95 years old, he went to the apartment to speak to him and he said he was sitting there with his Bible open and he was still making notes in the margin at 95 years old. Lee, Dr. Charles Weigel, gave his life to the Lord when he was 12 years old. He wanted to be a preacher. And so he did his study and ultimately married and ultimately became an evangelist. And so he preached in a number of states not too far from his home. He became a traveling evangelist. One day after he had returned home from a series of meetings, his wife came to him and she said, Charlie, I'm leaving you. I never signed up to be a preacher's wife. That might be what you want to do, but I do not want to do that. And so she took their daughter, and Dr. Weigel says one of the hardest days of his life was when he put his wife and daughter on a train to go clear across the United States. Ultimately, his wife died a few years later through a profligate, a, a wicked kind of living Dr. Weigel, for the next five years, though he had written over a thousand songs, ultimately, most of them I do not know. Uh, for example, he wrote, I Sing of Thee. I've never heard that. He wrote A Garden of Roses. I've never heard that song. Uh, he wrote a song called When I Come to the Edge of Eternity. I've never heard that song. But he says that when his wife and daughter left him, he became so despondent, he wondered, does anybody care does anybody really care? He ultimately married again, but in those five years, he said his heart was the darkest it had ever been, and he wondered, does anybody really care? And he wrote in 1932 a hymn that we all know, the one hymn that he wrote that we do know, and it goes like this. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus since I found in him a friend so strong and true, I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his strong and loving arms around me, and he led me in the way I ought to go. Every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his words of love, but I'll never know why he came to save me till someday I see his blessed face above. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. No, There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. And that is the message of Easter. It is that God in heaven has cared so much for you and me that he came to this earth and died for our sins and rose again the third day. 